Hello and welcome to uh, Making Music's first webinar on uh, orchestra tax relief, um, which is in fact neither exclusively for orchestras, um, nor do you have to be uh, paying tax in order to claim this relief, but more on that in the next hour. So I'm Barbara Eifler and I'm the Executive Director of Making Music and myself and Ben Saffel have been researching this extensively and are very happy to talk um, to any of you after this uh, webinar as well on this topic. Um, so the way we're going to run this in the next hour is that I will be talking uh, through a series of slides which will uh, explain some of the background and um, eligibility. Um, and uh, uh, then we will have a, a five minute break. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you can email them uh, throughout to info at makingmusic.org.uk. Um, uh, or, as the likelihood is, that you, you may well have your question answered in slide 22 that you had at slide 3, um, you might want to wait till the five minute break um, and then email your questions uh, at that point to info at makingmusic.org.uk. Um, also, if you're having any technical issues um, in terms of sound or whatever, please also email info um, with a, a telephone number um, so someone can get back to you. Okay, so um, now to get started. Um, these are the sorts of four areas that I'll be looking at. A little bit of background on orchestra tax relief, um, the criteria and eligibility, uh, what concerts and groups are eligible, um, the, the practicalities of what it means and uh, how you can actually make a claim. So, firstly, a little bit of background. Uh, creative Industries tax reliefs were first introduced in 2007 by the government. Uh, the first one was for film. Um, they were mainly for commercial uh, organisations, including um, uh, animation, high-end television uh, and others. Uh, the nearest one to orchestra tax relief was theatre tax relief, which was introduced three years ago and has brought uh, many millions of new pounds into the theatre production uh, industry. Um, so um, now we have orchestra tax relief. So in fact, um, the tax relief is a, a misnomer. It, effectively, this is state aid by a, a different uh, way. Um, and the intention is that this tax relief should act as an incentive to encourage, in this case, the production of orchestral concerts. Um, so a really uh, striking thing about this is that there, there is no cultural test. So if you're applying for project funding, say from Arts Council or other funders, you, you know, there, there's always various uh, criteria that you need to fulfill that the that funder has. Um, here, there is no cultural test, there is no test whatsoever. The, the money is intended for the production of orchestral concerts, provided they meet their definition, um, and they can be large or small, um, they can be with a, a you know, fairly large range of instruments, they can be good or bad, and they can be with modern music or ancient music or whatever you like. Um, so it is simply for the production of orchestral concerts. And what uh, this will result in is an actual check being sent to you by HMRC. It's a payable tax credit. So, the first comment that we've had from uh, members is, it's too difficult and too complicated. Now, in order to claim this relief, you will need to get your head around some, some concepts that you may be unfamiliar with, unless you're an accountant. Um, but, bear in mind that the reward for your group could be, uh, you know, some additional money, and this is not one-off money. If you go through this effort, it will then be easier to claim that money again every year. There is no 
what they call sunset clause on this legislation. So it's not like it's only designed from now till 2020 or anything. Um, in theory, this is here to stay. And as I say, the, the film one, which is the first one, has been in existence for 10 years. Um, so there's no reason to think that, that this one will disappear anytime soon. The second comment that we've had from a lot of uh, members, particularly um, uh, alarmed treasurers, is that all the work will rest with me. Now, it is very likely that the rest of the committee will uh, you know, be only too happy for you to be getting on with it. Um, but uh, do not worry, because you're not on your own if you are that treasurer. Making Music is here to help you every step of the way. Um, we have lots of online information if you're from a member group that you can uh, access. And, uh, but you are also uh, really uh, welcome to email or ring us uh, with your queries. We're really trying to, to help you make the most of this money that's on offer. And so this uh, is a question that lots of members ask us, why are we doing this? Why is Making Music doing this? Um, we feel that this money is generally on offer in order to support orchestras, professional and amateur. Amateur are specifically referenced in the legislation. And we also know that many of you, you know, have a difficult balancing act in making your groups financially sustainable. This is one way that can contribute to that. So, um, you know, we think it's, it's uh, worth us putting time and effort into this because we think it could really help a lot of groups. So, um, let's look at some criteria and eligibility. Now, they have a very specific definition of an orchestral concert. It's a concert by an orchestra, ensemble, group or band consisting wholly or mainly of instrumentalists who are the primary focus of the concert. So, um, choir accompanied by an orchestra, no. But if there is some incidental singing, then yes. So the, the easiest examples are Beethoven 9, yes. Handel Messiah, no. Um, the, the, the key question that HMRC have asked us to consider is, you know, when you're thinking about whether your orchestral concert is eligible, is who are the audience coming to see? Are they coming to see a choir? Then the answer will be, this is not an, you know, not an orchestral concert by their definition. Uh, if the audience are coming to see an orchestra, an instrumental group, with a little bit of incidental singing, then you'll be all right. Um, there are other things that are excluded from their definition of orchestral concert. And they are, you know, if uh, you're doing a concert in order to, to advertise or promote goods or services, um, this we don't feel would apply very much to making music members, but, you know, professional orchestras, if you think about it, you know, they get engaged for car launches or whatever. So, so that would not be eligible. Um, also not eligible are performances that are part of a competition or contest. And thirdly, what they exclude is uh, if the a main purpose of of the performance is to make a recording. So that's why if, if the recording is incidental, if it's a concert that you happen to be recording as well, or you're just recording for your own archive purposes, there's no problem with that. It's just whether the main purpose of the event uh, is to make a recording. Assuming you have an orchestral concert, um, is it a qualifying orchestral concert? And um, for that, it is to be live before a paying public or for educational purposes. So, before a paying public means that if you only do free concerts or concerts um, that only ask for donation, these will not qualify. Um, if you charge uh, 10p per ticket, they will be qualifying. So you might want to look at what your ticket model is, um, you know, if you, if you think it's worth you, um, uh, you know, having qualifying orchestral concerts. So educational purposes uh, means that this will cover, for example, if you go, uh, you know, into prison to perform for a group of inmates, or you go into care home to perform uh, to residents there, 
Um, so, so that means that you can still uh, claim for the costs of those kinds of concerts because they're deemed to be for educational purposes. The only exclusion there is if you were connected to the beneficiaries. So a school concert by pupils for their parents, that is connected to the beneficiaries and that would not be a qualifying orchestral concert. But if you go into a care home where one of your groups aunt happens to be a resident, that does not count as a connection. Um, so the other thing that's very important for a qualifying orchestral concert is that it needs to have at least 12 instrumentalists. And yes, they do need to be on stage at the same time. Um, so you, a concert that has you know, a trio followed by a duo for a, by a quartet, etc., would not be eligible. But if you have at least um, 12 instrumentalists on stage at the same time, then that is a qualifying uh, uh, orchestral concert. And the other thing is that none or a minority of the instruments uh, should be directly amplified. So uh, what they're trying to exclude basically is, um, uh, you know, rock bands, pop bands, um, but the minority of instruments allows for any uh, sort of um, orchestras that happen to have uh, include um, electric guitars or have some sort of weird or wonderful modern electronic uh, instruments as part of them. But so minority, fine, but um, uh, not all of them. <clears throat> so um, the other question, let's assume that you've decided you have uh, what you do uh, throughout the year are orchestral concerts and that they are or a number of them are qualifying orchestral concerts. The next thing you need to look at, and this is where we're starting to get a bit technical, is who is putting on the concert. Um, so, uh, in order to claim orchestra tax relief, uh, you need to fill in a company tax return to HMRC. Um, only uh, certain types of organizations can do that. Um, and that is the kind of organization, therefore, that needs to be putting on the concert. Therefore, um, concerts need to be produced by an incorporated body. Um, so an incorporated body is an entity which is a legal person in its own right. It can enter into contracts by itself. For instance, the company limited by shares or by guarantee, a charitable incorporated organization. Those are some of the the forms that we know that making music members use. An unincorporated organization is not a legal entity in itself. Many of you are unincorporated. You may be charities, but that does not make you incorporated. Um, so if you're in an unincorporated association or a, a charity, then you are unincorporated. And this means that uh, your trustees or your committee members will be individually you know, liable for, for um, the organization, you know, for, for contracts or, or whatever else. Um, obviously, do not worry because most of you have trustees indemnity insurance and provided you do not act negligently, you know, that will cover you for some of that. But this is just to explain the difference between unincorporated and incorporated. Um, an incorporated organization is separate from the trustees or committee members and uh, is a legal entity. And it's such an entity that needs to be putting on the concert in order to claim orchestra tax relief. So therefore, you have uh, three choices um, on, on how you proceed now in terms of producing your uh, orchestral concerts. Um, if your music group is already incorporated, for instance, a company limited by guarantee or a CIO, you can claim orchestra tax relief through your music group. If your music group is currently not incorporated, you could incorporate, for instance, become a CIO to claim orchestra tax relief. But you can also, and this is the path that we suggest you take, set up a separate production company which will be incorporated and which will claim orchestra tax relief for you. 
So here's some of the thoughts on, uh, you know, incorporating the main music group versus a separate production company. Okay, the the reason uh, that there's three main reasons we suggest that whether your main group is already incorporated or not, that you form a separate production company. Right. The first one is in order to help you maximise what you can claim from orchestra tax relief. So I'll explain. If you um, uh, the, if the production company merely puts on your concerts, um, the income from those concerts and any other income the group has will go to the main group. This could be your subscriptions or it could be fundraising or a grant from someone or, or a legacy, whatever. That would go into the main group. The production company only gets paid a fee equal to the costs of actually putting on the concerts. So therefore, uh, you will understand that, you know, th that will mean at the end of the financial year of the production company, it will be able to make a maximum claim for orchestra tax relief, which is not clouded by any other income or expenditure issues that may affect the main group. It will also, in the long term, uh, run, make it administratively easier to have a separate production company. It may not seem like it right now, but once you've done the setting up and, and getting into the groove of running your group slightly differently, it will be easier. And thirdly, we are uh, launching a couple of services to help you make these claims, and we can only help you if you set up a separate production company. Um, and this is merely because in order to offer you a, a cost-effective service, we need to keep it as simple uh, as possible uh, in terms of what we provide. So, um, some more information about who is putting on the concert. So, the production company that is responsible for putting on the concert needs to be responsible from the very start of the production process to the finish. So, you can't sort of suddenly transfer responsibility to the production company halfway through. So, if you are even vaguely contemplating using the structure in order to claim orchestra tax relief a year down the line, it is uh, highly recommended that you set up a production company as soon as possible. And we have lots of help for you to do that, and that part is not a time-consuming or, or difficult uh, thing to do. Um, that production company is then the one that signs all the relevant contracts, for instance, with a venue or the uh, MD, um, or the music hire, or whatever. And the this is one of the uh, sort of slightly irritating things. It does need to have a separate bank account. Um, now, part of the guidance and, and online resources that we have is some more information on having small business uh, bank accounts, which is what this would be. Um, Moving on from who's putting on the concert, um, not all concert uh, costs are actually eligible for a claim. So uh, here I just kind of give you some headlines on that. Um, so what this tax relief supports is production versus performance. So in other words, you can claim uh, for the costs leading up to a concert, but not for the costs of the actual concert. Um, for instance, if you have an afternoon rehearsal before a concert, you can claim the costs for that, but you can't claim the costs for the actual evening performance. Um, therefore, what you need to do is think about how you apportion those costs across a term. So, for instance, if your uh, MD is, is engaged for uh, 12 sessions a term, one of which is a concert and 11 of which are rehearsals, then you could claim for 11 twelfths of his or her uh, fee. Um, if you have the concert venue in the afternoon for rehearsal, you could claim half the higher cost for the concert venue because that would be dedicated to rehearsal, just not the half that is used for the concert. Um, and obviously you could claim for all of the 11 weeks or however long it is that you've been rehearsing towards this concert in your usual rehearsal venue. So the other thing is that you can uh, uh, claim 
for any directly incurred expenditure on the concert. So as I mentioned, this could be rehearsal venue, uh, music hire, music purchase, uh, a commission of new music, your conductor or accompanists, uh, or both costs. Um, if you engage soloists, uh, instrumental reinforcements, section leaders, either on a regular basis or for the day of the concert, you know, you're bound to engage them for a rehearsal as well, so those costs could be eligible. Um, but what is excluded is any marketing costs towards the concert. So that obviously will be a chunk of your budget, we imagine. Um, the other exclusions uh, uh, that don't particularly apply to making music member groups, we think, so it's financing. For instance, in a professional ensemble, you know, you might be taking out a loan to do a particular project and then have costs in financing that loan. Uh, but those wouldn't be eligible. Legal services, again, you are unlikely to engage a, a firm of lawyers to, to do your contract. Um, storage, that may affect um, some members, uh, so you can't claim for the cost of storage. The other thing you can't claim for is for ordinary running costs and infrastructure costs. So, uh, for instance, you could not claim for your uh, annual Making Music membership uh, subscription or, or the regular insurance that, that you take throughout. But what you could claim for, for instance, is if you were hiring uh, a piano, a grand piano especially for the concert, and that would cost you an extra £30 in insurance for that concert, then that, you know, you can claim obviously for the hire of the piano and, uh, uh, and for the, the additional insurance. And as I say, the actual performance costs are excluded. So, um, uh, let's assume, therefore, that you have orchestral concerts, you have qualifying orchestral concerts, uh, you have set up a production company, and that production company um, has looked at the eligible concert costs. But so, how does this thing actually work? So, orchestra tax relief is a tax relief paid out by HMRC or used to reduce a corporation tax bill which is not generally the case in your, uh, uh, in Making Music Members Group's case, on submission of a company tax return. If the company tax return shows a loss, that loss is surrendered to HMRC, which will pay out orchestra tax relief against it. So essentially, if your um, production company is paid a fee to produce your concerts, which equals the costs, then in theory, the bottom line is zero on that production company's tax. But so what you can do is you the eligible concert costs are deducted again as an additional loss, and that would be the amount that they would uh, pay out against. So orchestra tax relief is paid at a rate of 25% on 80% of eligible core costs. Okay. The first comment we get on that is we don't pay corporation tax. So I've addressed, you know, I talked a little bit about this. So you don't need to have a tax bill in order to get the relief, but you do need to submit a company tax return, which is why we're saying, you know, it has to be an incorporated body that, that makes that company tax return. And why that concert needs to be produced by that incorporated organization. And what the structure that we suggest is a private company limited by shares, but there's more on that from me later. The other comment, as I said, is that people say, but we don't make a loss on our uh, concert. Um, but as I said, the income goes to the, uh, to the parent organization, to your uh, main music groups, but the expenditure for the concert comes through the production company. So if you make a massive profit uh, on the concert, then that will not affect the bottom line of the production company, which can still show a loss and claim orchestra tax relief. Okay, So the, this is how the, the process would work, is your music group commissions the production company to produce its concerts. The parent organization, the music group, pays the production company a fee to produce its concert, which equals the costs. And then the production company claims the orchestra tax relief and repays that to the parent organization. The bottom line, therefore, is that ultimately you, as the main music group, pay less 
to produce the same concerts you always have been producing. Here's an example from one of our small groups. Um, so, uh, uh, smallish, uh, you know, they have a turnover of under 9,000 a year. So, on their three concerts in the year, they spend £7,261. Of these, the eligible core costs, i.e. the 7,261 minus marketing and actual performance costs, leaves them with 4,475, and 80% of that is 3,580. That, uh, the taxable, uh, a payable tax credit on that would be 895. Now, you will have some costs in order to make that claim, and, um, I'll explain a little bit more about those uh, in a minute, but those costs could be either 223 or 373 pounds. Um, so the net gain for that particular group for the year would be either 672 pounds or 522 pounds. And that would equate to respectively 9% or 7% of their total concert budget. So, on uh, our website, we have a spreadsheet uh, example where you could work through your own costs and come up with what you uh, could potentially stand to gain in a year. This is just one example that shows you that even on a uh, quite small spend and a small group, um, you know, you could come out with something uh, worthwhile. So, um, what do you need to actually get going uh, on this structure? So the first thing is to set up a production company whether or not your group is incorporated. Um, the form that you need to fill in to do this will take you less than an hour to complete and will cost £40. And within two weeks, you will have a company number, at which point you're kind of ready to give that production company uh, work in terms of producing your concert. Now, the shareholders and directors of the production company, we are suggesting, um, should be some, but not all, of the trustees or committee members of your music group. So, uh, firstly, if your music group is already incorporated, then the production company is a wholly owned subsidiary of the main group. So, there's one shareholder to the production company, and that is the music group. In that scenario, all you need to do is nominate a minority of your trustees as directors of the subsidiary. If your music group is not incorporated, then the number of shareholders and directors and the, the identity of the shareholders and directors should be the same, just for simplicity's sake. Now, why are we saying they should be um, uh, overlapping but not the same number? Because you are uh, subcontracting the work of putting on the concerts to this production company. Now, if the directors of that production company, the shareholders and directors, were completely external to your group, and uh, they are responsible for putting those concerts on, uh, there could be a scenario where they could decide something that isn't actually what the main music group wants, wants to do. Um, so therefore, it should be some of the same personnel. But it shouldn't be all of the same personnel, because you need to leave yourself space in the main music group to take decisions as trustees or committee members in which you have a greater voice than the number of directors as a production company. So, for instance, if you have eight trustees, we suggest you might make three of them directors, shareholders of the, uh, of the production company. That leaves five that aren't, that can take decisions without involving the other three, if necessary. Some other practical stuff. Um, so, if you set up a company, please set a, uh, tell us as soon as you've uh, done that. Your um, making music insurance uh, services insurance will cover the company as well. Um, open a separate bank account for the production company. Um, obviously, that sometimes takes a little bit of time. And this is a new concept I'm just introducing, email HMRC an election if you're planning to treat several or all of your concerts in a year as one trade. 
So what does this mean? This is you could claim for each of your concerts separately. That would be one trade. Now, if you do three or four concerts in a year, however, you might want to uh, claim for all of them in one go. Um, and in which case, HMRC lets you do that, but they are asking for advance notification of that, and that is what this election is. Um, and in that election, they require you to submit a certain amount of information, which is date, venue, I think just date, venue, and title of concert. And we know that that uh, is sometimes a problem. So if you're wanting to treat uh, the series of all the concerts next year uh, as one trade, you might not yet have conf uh, confirmation of the venue for the last one or two. Um, so what is happening here is that you don't need to tell them what you're treating as an election until the day before the first concert in the series. So you might be setting your budget now and you might be commissioning the production company to produce these concerts now for 2018, but actually your first 2018 concert is not till February 21st. So provided you email on 20th of February, by which time you may know the venues for December 2018. Um, so you can then email an election on the 20th of February. However, if you can't confirm, then it's not a problem because you can't make a separate claim for any additional concert. What you can't do is change an election once you've done, done it. Um, so you can, um, uh, if for some reason one of your concerts doesn't take place, say for instance excessive snowfall, um, uh, you have to cancel it, that's not a problem. But what you can't do is, is alter any of the details or add another concert to it. So another um, practical consideration that you need to think about is cash flow for the production company. Because obviously a production company has no income apart from a fee from your music group. But so one model that you might use is that your parent organization, your music group, um, gives the production company a staggered loan. So when you set your budget for 2018, say, you could agree that your treasurer can loan the production company up to, say, £7,500 over the course of the year in uh, chunks to be determined. And that then uh, authorises the treasurer to, to shift that money as and when it's needed by the production company. Right, uh, we've nearly come to the end. So um, uh, what can Making Music uh, do to help you? So firstly, we have a template memorandum and articles for a private company limited by shares, which is free for members to use, and a number of other documents that you might need around that. And there's also lots of guidance to tell you how to register a company, what the filing duties are, and all the practical implications that I've sort of started talking through. Um, once you're up and running, what you also need to do is you need to do a contract with the production company to produce a concert or series of concerts, annual or per concert or series of concerts to be produced. That production company then signs contracts with venues and soloists, hires the music, etc. All the cons, uh, costs for the concert are invoiced to the production company and paid out by it from its bank account. And then uh, at some point, the group pays the production, production company to do this work a fee equivalent to the costs. So if the costs change from the initial budget, that's fine, because what orchestra tax relief is about is actual costs. So it's not against your budget that it will be paid out, it will be paid out in terms of what you actually spend. So if your budget was seven and a half, but you ended up spending 8,503, that's fine, um, or the other way around. So what we have here in terms of help is that we have a template contract between the parent organization and the production company with notes accompanying it on how to, to fill it in. And again, that's, that's free for members only. Now, what you will need to do is do this contract for every concert or series of concerts that you're asking the production company to produce for you. But this is why it's very easy. All it needs is filling in literally the details of the concerts on the template. 
So end of the financial year, what happens now? So this is the end of the financial year for the production company, not the general tax year, which finishes on, uh, on the 5th of April, not the financial year of your music group. So at the financial year of the production company, the production company needs to produce statutory accounts. Okay, so just to, to add um, something here, the, the default financial year of the production company will be 12 months from the moment when you register it. Um, you can align this with your music group's financial year if you wish. And again, we have some guidance on that uh, on the website. It's too much detail to go into right now. So the production company needs to produce statutory accounts and these need to be filed with Companies House plus an annual confirmation statement, formerly known as an annual return. This costs £13. And then the company tax return needs to be made to HMRC, which includes the orchestra tax relief claim and certain what they call non-statutory information. For instance, how, how you're planning to apportion the costs between rehearsals and performance. Now, one word of caution here, um, you are most likely uh, to be running the accounts for your music group on a cash basis but actually uh, the accounts for the production company need to be on an accruals basis. So the difference here is on a cash basis, you will register any income or expenditure in the financial year in which they are received or spent, whether they relate to a concert in that year or not. In accruals accounting, you account for expenditure in relation to the year that it belongs to, and again, the same with income. So if you have three concerts in 2018, and obviously you might have some expenditure, for instance, venue deposit or whatever in 2017, then those expenses and that income, they would get allocated to 2018, not to 2017. Again, we are just about to publish a, a much more detailed guidance on what that means and how to do that uh, on the website. So please go and have a look. Right, now uh, very briefly, what we have devised to help you with this is two services. Um, one is uh, online templates for you to produce statutory annual accounts, which will then check be, be checked for technical accuracy by by making music. Now, the reason we've separated this out from the second part uh, of the service is because you may not need the service if you have an accountant, for instance, on your committee who's your treasurer. They may be able to do this for you. And by the way, statutory annual accounts for a small company like that are actually simpler than they would be for a charity. So th this is not a, a, a massively onerous thing to do. Um, and the second service is that making music would file the company tax return and orchestra tax relief claim on your behalf with HMRC. Now, the reason for offering this is that you can do this yourself, but you cannot claim orchestra tax relief through the free software uh, that small companies can generally use to submit their company tax return to HMRC. So in other words, you would have to buy software costing around £400 a year and that would mean that we feel for a lot of smaller groups um, that would wipe out any gains that you might possibly make from orchestra tax relief. So we are offering these two services in order to make orchestra tax relief accessible and worthwhile for more groups and for smaller groups. Uh, these two services will have to be chargeable services and we're not looking to make money, we are just looking to cover it our costs on this because it will be quite staff intensive and for groups with income below 31k um, you know the first service will uh, first and second service would cost 125 uh, plus VAT each and for larger groups um, 250 plus VAT uh, due to the uh, anticipated greater complexity and we're not making these services available for groups with income above 100,000 uh, because we feel that they would be better off using a, an accountant. Um, so uh, I have uh, galloped through my presentation. Uh, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. So um, don't log off. Uh, we'll be having a short break. Um, 
during which, you know, please email your questions and uh, we'll come back in about uh, four minutes to, to answer your questions. So please email them to info at makingmusic.org.uk. Thank you.
Okay, hello um, and welcome back to, to the session on orchestra tax relief. Um, so I will do my best to answer as many questions as possible, uh, but we will answer the rest of the questions uh, via email or you're welcome to, to bring up as well. Um, so uh, the first one, if a supplier raises an invoice using our orchestra's charity main name, can we pay it from our new um, orchestra tax relief limited uh, account and claim for it in the usual way? Um, no. So the supplier should be invoicing the production company. Um, so this may just be an initial thing because obviously once you're set up um, you know you can just make sure that all your suppliers are, are aware of the situation and uh, by the way this is also why it may be helpful to have a, a production company name that is quite close to your main charity name so so that people will still recognize that it's you so you know if it's whatever um, you know the East Dulwich um, Amateur Orchestra uh, you know and just stick a limited at the end um, will it be acceptable to pay all bills from uh, Orchestra Tax Relief Limited whether expected to be allowed for Orchestra Tax Relief or not, for instance, publicity? Although we cannot claim for publicity, it might make the treasurer's job easier if all outgoings are going out from one account. Um, so, absolutely. So what you are giving the production company the job to do is to produce those concerts for you in their entirety. Then you will look at the end of the year at which of those costs are uh, not allowed, for instance, the marketing. Um, and as you know, then that will leave you with the eligible core costs and only 80% of those are allowed. But all the production costs should go through the production company. Um, if you have a production company, but some costs are incurred by the orchestra, for instance, music hire, can the orchestra recharge the hire costs to the production company? Um, no, I think it's a short answer here. Um, so really, you should make sure that in future it's the production company that hires the, the music. Um, and also, we have had a question in the past where members have asked, you know, we've bought some music um, uh, for one concert, and that's the point when you can uh, uh, kind of offset it with the orchestra tax relief, but uh, can we then hire it to the production company, um, uh, you know, in kind of concerts? And no, uh, the, you can't. Um, and the same would apply to, you know, if you buy a staging for one particular concert, you could offset it then, but you can't then uh, rehire it because that's an artificial thing. Um, so should the production company contract with the conductor be for the full fee, including the concert or just for the rehearsals? No, it should be for the full fee. And then you can demonstrate how you apportion that according to which parts of his or her fee are uh, concerts. Um, there's another question on apportionment and eligible costs. So um, this person asks, um, okay, because I mentioned that you can uh, offset the cost of hiring, for example, a piano for the concert, and ask, isn't this a performance cost? And the same with the soloist. Well, you can, what you can do is apportion the fact that, you know, if you're having a rehearsal the evening before or the afternoon before with that piano, with that soloist, then those costs can be offset against orchestra tax relief. So let's assume 50-50, you know, you have the venue for uh, uh, the, the, the soloist and the piano for four hours in the afternoon and four hours in the evening, then you can offset the cost of the four hours in the afternoon. So basically half the cost of hiring the piano, half of the insurance for it, half of the soloist's fee, you could apportion. You might do it differently, but that, I'm just saying that that's one way that you could be looking at it. Um, so there's a question about a separate production company. If you're a company limited by guarantee and also have charitable status, do you still need to set up a production, separate production company for orchestra tax relief? You don't have to. But we're recommending that you do basically can maximize 
the amount of orchestra tax relief uh, you claim, and also to keep it all neatly in one administrative pigeonhole, all the costs that are related to that, because we do know that member groups have other income, other expenditure, uh, whether that's, you know, f fundraising, um, funding grants, you know, membership subscriptions, uh, etc. So, so we're recommending that that is the best structure. And, and as I said, the services that we will be providing to help members claim, we can only provide if you do set up this this structure um, we can only provide these services at this very low price if the if we know that they're all going to be of a very um, simple um, if the structure is going to be simple and and therefore the claims that we need to make are fairly simple so uh, I've got another question here on eligibility and repertoire and uh, that is um, would a concert where one piece was accompanying a choir not be eligible? We have an amateur orchestra and choir with about 50 members in each. We perform joint concerts with some orchestral and some choir works, often mixed in the same concert, and also works for choir and orchestra like Vaughan Williams' C Symphony. Are these concerts eligible? I find the HMRC definition of eligibility unclear in these cases. Well, there are some grey areas, obviously. Um, as I said, you should be asking yourself, you know, who uh, is the audience coming to see? And uh, HMRC have said to us that in some cases of doubt, they might well look at marketing material. So if your marketing material is full of a choir singing and no violin to be seen, then you're probably on to a loser. Um, but the other thing is there are, you know, the HMRC would rather answer questions now um, before you put in a claim and are then disappointed. So if you have specific repertoire, um, I want to say that the C symphony is acceptable, but I can't remember. And I would encourage you, please, to, to email uh, info again, um, or, or Ben will get back to you on that. Um, but uh, certainly, if you can use um, a past concert program specifically so that HMRC can see exactly what you mean by this mixture of choir and orchestra, then that would be really helpful and they would be prepared to, to answer uh, questions in advance. Um, so, uh, I think I've come to the end of the current questions. Um, and uh, I would just like to say I'm sure that you will have other questions. I would encourage you to go and read all the guidance on the website. And as I say, um, uh, Ben and myself will be only too happy to, to answer any other questions, either by phone or by email. Um, uh -huh, ben is just handing me some more questions that have come in. Okay. Um, so, setting up the production company, the memorandum and articles don't make any reference to the purpose or function of the company. Is that usual? Um, I think that is usual. You're probably used to charity constitutions that obviously have to have objectives, I think. So, uh, but this may be something that uh, Ben and I have to answer via email. Um, could a production company be set up to serve several orchestras or would the complications be too onerous or impossible? I, feel, I mean, some of you are a sort of multiple entities where you do have, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a group and then a youth group and then a choir or something. So I think in that case, probably could be one production company. Um, I think it might be too complicated to serve orchestras, but um, if you will bear with us, I think that's something that we'd also like to answer in a separate email. Um, next question. We're in the process of getting CIO, that's Charitable Incorporated uh, uh, Organization, registration. Do we need to wait for this before setting up a production company? Um, no, I don't think you do. Um, if you do you already have a member for the CIO? 
Um, I think we, again, I think Ben and I can look into that. Uh, I would have thought that that's not the problem. Um, so, making music service, please can you refresh us on what the 125 plus VAT making music service number one gives us? Um, can we do that setup piece without it? So you can set up the production company and you can do contracts with it between your music group uh, and the production company. That is all free templates. You can do all that now and it will not cost you anything. Making Music has invested in the appropriate legal templates and we, you know, they are differentiated ones for Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, you know, have slightly different legal systems. Um, so, so all that is available to Making Music members free now. Um, the services that we're offering is the first one would just give you a template um, to create statutory accounts, which is the basis for the orchestra tax relief. Now, we can't do these for you and we cannot provide advice because we are not a firm of accountants. Um, so what we can do is just provide you with the means for you to put together these statutory accounts. However, we've separated that out from making the actual claim because we know that many of you have accountants as treasurers who will be perfectly capable of producing these simple statutory accounts or you may already as a group be using an accountancy firm and you'd prefer to use those. So that's fine. But otherwise, this is just a help for you to produce statutory accounts. The second part of the service is the bit that we think most of you probably can't do on your own because you would have to buy the software. So that's the so the first service only buys you basically uh, uh, um, easy uh, you know templates and help to set up these statutory accounts. And we would check that you put the right things in the right place and that they are fit for purpose in terms of the actual you know template and format etc. Before they go forward to HMRC. Um, right, so I'm afraid uh, I think we need to stop um, as it's 7.30. Um, I hope this has been useful for you and do uh, please get in touch if you have any further questions and we'll be reviewing how this went and uh, offering some more webinars as well as one-to-one -one, uh, sessions in the autumn uh, on this topic. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye. <laughs>